Look, mister, there's three rules you've got to follow. And I'm sure those rules were followed and everyone lived happily ever after. <laughs> Around this time of year, everyone loves to make that joke that Die Hard is a Christmas movie. It's funny, of course, because Die Hard isn't exactly Hallmark fair. Which got me thinking of another classic Christmas movie that deserves a little more love. Gremlins. Originally released in 1984, Gremlins is a horror comedy film and yes, Christmas movie, directed by Joe Dante and written by Chris Columbus, who notably directed Home Alone, the most iconic Christmas movie of the 90s, along with creative practical effects, a wicked sense of humor, some sentimentality, and a healthy dose of camp. Gremlins also features an incredibly Christmassy aesthetic. It takes place in a picturesque little town festooned with decorations and dripping with charm. And I will be spoiling everything about this almost 40-year-old movie, so consider this your warning. Gremlins is a cautionary tale in which unsuccessful traveling inventor Randy Peltzer, played by Hoyt Axton, You take your toothbrush out, and you push this button. Procures a mysterious creature called a mogwai from a problematically stereotypical shop in Chinatown as a gift for his son. He does so against the wishes of the shopkeeper, played by Key Luke, who refuses to sell it to him. That's two hundred dollars. I'm sorry. Mogwai, not for sale. And the man's grandson, played by John Louis, offers to sell it to Randy behind his back. Here it is. Oh, right. What about your grandfather? Look at what he's at. He's crazy. We need the money. The grandson warns Randy that there are three very important rules they must follow. Keep him out of the light, especially sunlight. It'll kill him. And keep him away from water. Don't get him wet. But the most important rule, never, never feed him after midnight. And of course, we see the results of these rules being broken when the mogwai multiplies. And some of the babies transform into terrifying little monsters that menace the Peltzer family and the idyllic town of Kingston Falls on Christmas Eve. It's a silly movie that definitely leans into the comedy side of horror comedy, but still has some surprisingly tense and scary moments. After watching Randy purchase the Mogwai in New York, we get some shots of Kingston Falls set to Christmas Baby, Please Come Home. And we're introduced to Billy, played by Zach Galligan, as he struggles to start his car. Billy is your standard awkward, but in a sweet, cute way, male protagonist. He's fine. After an uncomfortable exchange with his weird neighbor about foreign cars. His goddamn foreign cars, he always frees up on you. You don't find American machinery doing that. See that plow? It hasn't given me a day's trouble in 15 years. You know why? Kentucky Harvester. He gives up and decides to walk to his job at a local bank along with his dog Barney. And we're treated to a closer look at the quaint little town. Billy has an obvious crush on his coworker Kate, played by Phoebe Cates. Honestly, I had a crush on her when I was a kid too. Her whole deal is that she cares a lot about her community and people generally. We're trying to have Dory's pub declared a landmark. Mrs. Deagle's trying to take his lease away. And she really doesn't like Christmas. Next, we meet the comically unpleasant and Scrooge-like Mrs. Deagle, played by Polly Holiday. I'm afraid that neither one of us will be paid for two weeks. Couldn't you? The bank and I have the same purpose in life, to make money. When she confronts Billy at the bank about... What's left of my imported Bavarian snowman? Your dog broke it this morning. Like the vicious old lady in The Wizard of Oz, she demands Barney as recompense. Just tell me how much I owe you. I'll be more than happy to. I don't want money. I want your dog. The dog menaces her a little bit, and Barney gets a talking to from his boss. <laughs> what is that dog doing in here? Also, this is a bank, not a pet store. Very good, Gerald. Later on, Billy channels his frustration into art at the local bar. He's luckily not fired. A coworker tries to shame him for his mediocrity. Hey, Peltzer. Look, I'm a junior vice president at 23. Which is how we find out that Billy is actually the breadwinner for his family. Look at you. You're practically supporting your whole family. Ah, the 80s, when you could support an entire family with relative comfort on a bank teller's salary. Although, this does lead us to wonder where Billy's dad got the money he offered the shopkeeper for Gizmo. I'll give you $200. Like, did he get it from his son? That's kind of weird. We also find out that Kate has a second unpaid job as a waitress at the bar. You're working here? Yeah, weeknights, so Dora doesn't have to pay an extra waitress. I guess more of a volunteer position, because it's struggling financially. 
When Billy returns home, his father presents him with the Mogwai, and we are officially introduced to the cutest little guy you have ever seen. You're kidding. Gizmo. He kind of looks like a Furby, but without the creepy beak. Randy explains the rules to the family after Gizmo is startled by a camera flash. Oh, no. What happened? He hates bright lights. You know, there's some things I forgot to tell you guys. And his first night in the Peltzer household is mostly uneventful. <laughs> the next day, there's a scene with Billy trying to make some orange juice with a juice squeezer his dad made with comedic results. One of my favorite things about this movie is Billy's dad's inventions. We see a number of them, and they're all fun or even handy conceptually, but rarely work as intended. And I kind of just love Billy's dad. There's something really charming about someone who just isn't very good at something, relentlessly pursuing it anyways. It is unfortunate he relies on his son to pay the bills, though. Woof. A visiting neighborhood kid spills some water on Gizmo, who releases a series of sub-Gizmos. The babies seem to have a different personality from their parent, which the movie never really explains. Like they're tiny little demons who hassle Gizmo and tie up the dog. Billy decides to show the local biology teacher the stunning Mogwai reproductive process and leaves one of the babies with him. He does draw its blood, which it objects to. At the bar, Billy's weird racist neighbor, Mr. Futterman, insists that foreign cars have gremlins in them. You gotta watch out for the foreigners because they plant gremlins in their machinery. He's still on this. Put him in the cars, they put him in the TV, they put him in the stereos or the radios, you stick in your ears. He's very drunk, and Kate keeps him from driving home. I don't think it's such a good idea that you drive home. Why don't you walk home? You know, Katie, I think maybe I'll walk home. Good. Billy applauds her efforts. She mentions he only started behaving like this after he lost his job, which is a good observation about the misplaced anger a lot of people feel due to circumstances that are worth being angry about, but that they're blaming the wrong people for. Billy doesn't understand how someone can be unhappy during the holidays, and Kate tells him that the holidays are actually really hard for a lot of people. Well, everybody else is opening up their presents. They're opening up their wrists. Oh, geez. Okay, Kate. Pulling no punches. Cheery thought. It's true. The suicide rate's always the highest around the holidays. Randy ditches the family on Christmas Eve to attend some kind of inventor's convention. Although, the guys in the background are a lot of fun to watch. Back at the Peltzers, we find out just how unlike Gizmo the babies are when they unplug Billy's alarm clock, leaving it stuck at an earlier time to trick him into feeding them after midnight. Gizmo, notably, looks distressed and does not partake in the food, another thing that distinguishes him from his progeny. The next morning, the babies are in slimy cocoons, and the teacher's mogwai is also in a cocoon after consuming some food that he left out. Would you say this was called a putrid stage? They come out changed. The scene where they emerge is so good, though. I just have to take a moment to praise the practical effects again. They add so much texture to this movie. The poor biology teacher seems to somehow have gotten injected to death by the gremlin after it gets loose in his classroom. Billy discovers him and doesn't seem nearly upset enough about it. The gremlins are seemingly born innately understanding the workings of machines and how to manipulate them, which is both interesting and never addressed. It's also really never explained why Gizmo is a good little buddy, but his offspring appear to be evil from the start, even in their mogwai form, like they wanted to become gremlins. I turned to Wikipedia to learn a bit about the concept of a gremlin and where it came from, and apparently they're actually rather modern folklore that evolved in the 1900s to explain trouble with airplanes, expanding to include other technology over time. And I think that's really cool. For some reason, I assumed their origin would go back further, but it doesn't. It was first attributed to the British Royal Air Force and later popularized by a ruled doll novel. I also think it's great that some of the behaviors of the gremlins in the film, like pelting people with things, seem to intentionally resemble how they're depicted in World War II posters. It's fascinating how folklore continues to develop contemporaneously. In the movie, the gremlins also seem to be versed on pop culture at birth. Oh, no. um. They terrorize Billy's mom, Lynn, played by Frances Lee McCain, in a classic sequence initiated by the gremlins playing Do You Hear What I Hear on the record player while Lynn searches the house. She takes them out one by one. Some of the special effects age surprisingly well, others less so. She's holding her own, until she falls prey to a surprise attack from the Christmas tree. Billy rushes home after realizing his mom's in danger. 
and dispatches the gremlin. But unfortunately, one remaining gremlin, Stripe, named for his funny little mohawk, escapes. Billy drops his mom off with the town doctor and finds Gizmo trapped in the laundry chute where the gremlins yeeted him earlier. Side note, this movie and Honey, I Shrunk the Kids gave me such an irrational desire to live in a house with a laundry chute. And you would think more houses had laundry chutes. But alas, unfortunately, the stripey guy runs off and jumps into a YMCA swimming pool, resulting in a small army of gremlins that continue terrorizing the town. Billy, a silly little guy, tries to go to the police. Vicious little monsters for a present? No, no, they don't start out vicious at first. Oh, of course not. But as is their way, they're pretty useless about the whole thing and not interested in believing him, even with proof. And then Mr. Futterman and his wife are killed by the gremlins and the police rush off to check it out. Again, refusing to listen to anything that Billy has to say about the creatures or their involvement. It's supposed to be Christmas. What the hell's going on? Shut up for your friend! The gremlins also said a cab by cutting the brakes on the police cruiser. We get a scene with the gremlins tormenting Kate at the bar. And another weird thing about this movie that I have to acknowledge is some uncomfortable racial stereotypes. Yeah, and might I also remind you that I read your entire 15-page unsolicited treatise on why the gremlins is actually about suburban white fear of black culture. The gremlins are loud, talk and slang, are addicted to fried chicken and freak out when you get their hair wet. The only it's actually worse than Sam lets on here. It starts out relatively safe and funny with the gremlins acting like chaotic little monsters. And then it gets progressively... Oh no, ear as it goes. The gremlins listen to jazz music and breakdance while dressed in coated clothing as they drink, gamble, smoke, and torment the local white people. It totally went over my head as a kid, and I didn't even really pick up on it as an adult until researching this video. I got a little more than I bargained for. <laughs> The one wearing Mrs. Deagle's wig did really crack me up, though. I think for most white audiences, the stereotyping didn't really connect, but some black people have been critical of this element of the film since it came out. And of course, there's also some Orientalism in the portrayal of Mr. Wing, which stood out to me more obviously with the whole mysticism thing. It would be very nice if my fellow white people would stop injecting weird racism into fantasy characters at every opportunity, please. Just don't. It costs zero dollars to not. I still love this movie, but I'd sure love it more if this wasn't a part of it. It's also combined with the horror trope of the black guy dying first, all around unfortunate optics. On the bright side, the movie has a bit of an anti-capitalist bent in its treatment of Mrs. Deagle, who gets a ridiculous end at the hands of some gremlins and a stair chair. So at least there's that. No A Christmas Carol redemption arc here. In this movie, Scrooge gets got. This theme is also expressed in the film's general sense of disdain towards Billy's co-worker who brags about his future as a successful banker. Before everybody gets here, come on, old dollar bill. Yes. I do think it's bogus that Mrs. Deagle is also a crazy cat lady. I feel like that is not the cat lady representation that people deserve. Boo. After Gizmo and Billy help Kate escape the bar, they wander through town, which is still pretty charming, even warmed by the glow of flaming cars. Now I have another reason to hate Christmas. Okay, what are you talking about? And Kate tells us why she doesn't like Christmas. The worst thing that ever happened to me was on Christmas. Basically, her dad tried to surprise the family by dressing as Santa and literally climbing down the chimney, but he slipped and broke his neck, and the family didn't discover what happened to him for several days. It was snowing outside. The house was freezing, so I went to try to light up the fire. Until he started to smell. And that's when I noticed the smell. The fireman came and broke through the chimney top. And me and Mom were expecting them to pull out a dead cat or a bird. And instead, they pulled out my father. As a kid, I found that story to be memorably upsetting, despite the absurdity of it. And that's how I found out there was no Santa Claus. Apparently the studio hated it and wanted to take it out, but Columbus and Dante both fought to keep it in the movie. Though, some darker stuff from the original draft of the script was cut. Our little Scooby gang, or I guess Scooby trio, corners the gremlins in the movie theater where they're watching Snow White. They're watching Snow White, and they love it. And they blow up the theater, killing them. 
Except for one, the stripy leader who was across the street raiding a store for candy. Can't blame him, those theater prices are just outrageous. They have a standoff with the remaining gremlin in the local department store, which is a pretty entertaining sequence as they try to keep him away from water. Kate and Billy manage to squeeze in a smooch before springing into action. Kate turns on the lights. The gremlin gets its hands on a gun. <laughs> oh, America. And makes it to the fountain after trying to shoot Billy. <laughs> Luckily, Gizmo manages to bust open the skylight so that Stripe is blasted by Christmas Day sunlight and starts melting. It's pretty gruesome, and we get one last jump scare before it dissolves into goo. Everything returns to normal. The news blames the carnage on a Christmas Eve riot. Officials are now blaming mass hysteria for the escalating series of unexplained accidents, fires, and explosions that rocked this once peaceful town. There's also a fun little subplot with Ricky Rialto. The local radio DJ we hear at the start of the movie. Rolling with rockin' Ricky Rialto, the voice of Kingston Falls. And then get updates from as the gremlins take over his studio, along with the rest of the town. What's that? Kenny, what's that back there? Some of rockin' Ricky fans? Hey, you're not rockin' Ricky fans! At the end of the movie, we get one final update from him to know that he survived the night, but he does sound beleaguered. Hey, gang! It's been a rough night for Rockin' Ricky, but he's still on the air. And the shopkeeper returns to take the Mogwai back. I warned you, with Mogwai comes much responsibility. He has some justifiably harsh words for Randy. You do with Mogwai what your society has done with all of nature's gifts. But I didn't mean it. Like, bro, people died. Gizmo says goodbye to Billy. Bye, Billy and Mr. Wing and the Mogwai disappear together into the night as we close out the movie with a voiceover from Randy, warning us to check for gremlins when our electronics fail. <laughs> Turn on all the lights, check all the closets and cupboards, look under all the beds, because you never can tell. People died, Randy! Gremlins is a ridiculous movie, but Christmas is undeniably at its forefront. The Universal soundstage is like a Christmas window display come to life with all the decorations in town and the carolers and snow. And the plot does revolve around a Christmas present, with all of the mayhem unfolding on Christmas Eve. I know objectively that the best Christmas movie is obviously Home Alone, but Gremlins also holds a nostalgic place in my heart and I watch it every Christmas season. There are certainly some elements that don't age well but I like how it addresses the traditional, sentimental Christmas fodder while still acknowledging how hard the holidays can be for people for any number of reasons, which is often overlooked in these kinds of movies. Parts of this film hold up surprisingly well, and it's a great way to break up the monotony of all the Christmas movies about a busy, hardworking city girl returning to a small town and falling in love with her rugged high school sweetheart who owns the local insert whimsical small business here. The practical effects, performances of the cast, and absurd vibe make this one of my favorite Christmas movies of all time. But that's just my opinion. What do you think of Gremlins? What's your favorite Christmas movie? Let me know in the comments down below. Like, share, and subscribe for more videos. See you next time. Peter Zane.